By the time ingested material reaches the large intestine, most digestion and absorption have already been completed. Nonetheless, the colon has a critical role, not just in absorbing water and eliminating feces, but also is home to the trillions of microorganisms collectively known as the gut microbiota. The large intestine measures about 1.5 meters, but its actual length is longer than that. Three external longitudinal smooth muscle bands, called the tinea huli, draw the ends together to form saccules, called hostra, which correspond to the semilunar folds within the interior. The external surface of the large intestine is also characterized by small areas of fat called apoploic appendages. Unlike the gradual transition between the digenum and ileum in the small intestine, the large intestine can be divided into several well-defined anatomical regions. However, the most important division in the large intestine is the distinction between tissues derived from the midgut and tissues derived from the hindgut. These areas are supplied by a completely different set of arteries, veins, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Ingested material exits the small intestine through the ileocecal valve and enters the cecum, which serves as a temporary holding area as food enters the large intestine. With a diameter of about six centimeters, this muscular blind-ended pouch is the widest part of the large intestine. About 500 milliliters of chyme enter the cecum each day, where it is churned and mixed with mucus. The appendix projects from the cecum as a blind finger-like lymphoid structure. In modern humans, the appendix has a reputation for causing more harm than good, but that's not quite fair, as the appendix serves as a refuge for commensal bacteria and can quickly reseed the gut microbiota in the event of severe diarrhea or after a course of antibiotics. Beneficial though they are within the colon, the release of gut bacteria into the abdominal cavity through a ruptured appendix is a medical emergency and can quickly lead to sepsis. Until this point, digested food has generally moved further away from the mouth down the body. But when material leaves the cecum, it changes direction and moves cranially through the ascending colon via peristalsis. The ascending and descending colons are retroperitoneal and held rigidly in place by the peritoneum and tolts fascia. This muscular region is important in absorbing water and electrolytes and hosts bacteria that help to digest carbohydrates and produce vitamin K, a fat-soluble vitamin essential for clotting. However, the ascending colon is also a common site of colon cancer, especially a class of precursor lesions called sessile serrative adenomal polyps. The colon then turns sharply at the hepatic flexure and moves from right to left across the body to the transverse colon. Unlike the ascending and descending colon, the transverse colon is relatively mobile and attaches to the posterior abdominal wall through the transverse mesocolon. The colon makes another sharp turn at the splenic flexure and heads downward through the descending colon. Absorption of water and electrolyte continues in the descending colon, but this region also serves as storage for the accumulating fecal material. Gut bacteria in this region play an important role in fermentation of carbohydrates, releasing short-chain fatty acids and gas byproducts. Next, digested material moves posteriorly through the S-shaped curve of the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is not retroperitoneal and is attached to the abdominal wall through the mesocolon. Water absorbed in the sigmoid colon helps to solidify the fecal material. Mechanoreceptors in the sigmoid colon monitor distension and trigger strong muscle contractions that propel stole through the sharp angle of the rectosigmoid junction into the rectum. Unlike the rest of the large intestine, the 12 to 15 centimeter long rectum lacks tinea coli, hostra, semilunar folds, and epiploic appendages. Instead, it contains distinctive transverse folds called Houston's valves and two bends, the sacral and perineal flexures. Entry of stool into the normally empty rectum activates stretch receptors. The signal is propagated to the central nervous system, resulting in an urge to defecate. While defecation can be consciously delayed, increasing pressure within the ampulla triggers the involuntary rectoanal inhibitory reflex and causes the internal anal sphincter to relax. This convenient reflex provides a sampling mechanism to discriminate between solid, liquid, or gaseous contents and provides important feedback in the conscious control of defecation. During defecation, the rectum contracts and pushes feces through the three centimeter long anal canal and out through the anus. The anal canal is lined with non-keratinized simple squamous epithelium and differs histologically from the rest of the digestive tract. A distinctive feature of the anal canal is the presence of long folds called anal columns, interspersed with anal sinuses that secrete mucus, which helps to ease the passage of feces out of the body. Another important feature of the anal canal is the distinct differences in blood, lymphatic, and nervous supply above and below the pectinate line. Importantly, the anus contains both interior and exterior sphincters. 
The interior sphincter is under involuntary control, but the exterior sphincter is composed of skeletal muscle and can be controlled voluntarily, eventually. Blood is supplied to the large intestine through the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, which anastomose via the marginal artery of the colon. The transverse colon is supplied proximally by a branch of the superior mesenteric artery and distally by the inferior mesenteric artery. The marginal region in between is particularly sensitive to ischemia. As with most of the digestive tract, blood drains into the portal circulation and passes through the liver. This allows the liver to process nutrients and helps to protect the body from xenobiotics and pathogens, but it also leaves the liver vulnerable as a site of metastasis. Disruption of the superior venous plexuses in the anus can cause hemorrhoids, which can cause pain and pruritus as well as bleeding. The enteric nervous system of the large intestine implements several intricate reflex arcs. In particular, distension of the stomach and entry of food into the duodenum trigger their gastrocolic and duodenocolic reflexes, which induce mass propulsion of stool toward the rectum. This often causes an urge to defecate shortly after eating. The orthocolic reflex induces a similar effect after waking up in the morning. Smooth muscle contractions induce slow mixing through hostile contractions generated by the interstitial cells of Cajal. High amplitude giant migrating contractions also occur several times a day and propagate material rapidly through the colon. The enteric nervous system is capable of acting independently, but sympathetic stimulation to the superior and inferior mesenteric ganglia inhibit digestive activity as part of the fight or flight response. Conversely, parasympathetic stimulation by the vagus nerve in the midgut derived regions and the pelvic nerves in the hindgut derived regions promote digestive activity, i.e., rest and digest. Efficient movement of fecal matter through the large intestine is crucial for health, and disruptions often lead to either constipation or diarrhea. In Hirschsprung's disease, incomplete nervous development in a segment of the large intestine in newborns prevents the passage of stool and causes severe constipation. It's usually treated by removal of the affected area through pull-through surgery. Histologically, the large intestine follows the same pattern as the rest of the digestive tract, but can be readily identified due to the lack of villi and the presence of a large number of goblet cells. Goblet cells secrete mucus to ease the movement of feces through the colon and prevent mechanical and microbial damage to colonocytes. Stem cells at the base of each crypt divide to produce new colonocytes, which gradually migrate toward the surface and then are sloughed off. Some cells differentiate into neuroendocrine cells, such as the L cells, which secrete peptide YY. This substance slows gastric motility and increases absorption in the colon as part of the ileal break negative feedback loop. Similarly, the enterochromaffin cells release the neurotransmitter 5-HT, or serotonin, which modulates secretion and motility in the enteric nervous system. While the high cell turnover in the large intestine is protective, it also poses a cancer risk. Colorectal carcinogenesis is often triggered by chromosomal instability and is characterized by mutations in genes such as APC, KRAS, and TP53, causing aneuploidy and loss of heterozygosity. Colorectal cancer can also be caused by epigenetic instability in the CPG island methylator phenotype and microsatellite instability in Lynch syndrome. Uncontrolled cell division leads to the formation of small masses called polyps. Over time, polyps can become neoplastic and invade deeper layers. Because the descending colon and the sigmoid colon are narrower than more proximal regions, tumors in these regions may become symptomatic earlier and produce characteristic narrow stools. In stage four, cancer cells break away from the original tumor and metastasize to other organs, often the liver or the lungs. Colon cancer is the third most common type of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death. Fortunately, colonoscopy makes it possible to inspect the entire length of the large intestine and perform necessary procedures such as polypectomy and biopsy. Inflexible colonoscope with a light and camera is first inserted as far as the cecum and then slowly retracted while the surface of the colon is carefully inspected. When chyme enters the large intestine, it consists mainly of undigestible material, such as cellulose, dead epithelial cells, bacteria, pigments, electrolytes, and water. The large intestine might be best known for its role in water absorption, so it might be assumed that the small intestine contributes little in this regard. However, the small intestine absorbs up to six or seven liters of water each day. Where does all of this fluid come from? Some water comes from ingested food and liquids, but most is secreted in the stomach and small intestine to aid digestion and absorption. 
As a result, it's important to reabsorb as much of this water as possible, and inadequate reabsorption in the large intestine can cause severe dehydration. The large intestine normally absorbs between 1.5 and 2 liters of fluid each day, but it has the capacity to absorb as much as 7 liters. This is particularly important in diseases such as cholera, in which Vibrio cholerae secretes an endotoxin that causes the small intestine to lose up to 1 liter of water per hour. Under normal conditions, 200 milliliters or so of water is excreted as part of the feces to maintain the semi-solid consistency needed for smooth passage through the colon. Although water is reabsorbed through osmosis, blood in the portal capillaries is hypotonic relative to the intestinal lumen, requiring movement against its osmotic gradient. To create an osmotic path for water to enter the capillary bed, colonocytes secrete sodium ions across the basolateral membrane via the sodium-potassium pump. This causes sodium from the lumen to enter the cell passively through the epithelial sodium channel. Water then follows the concentration gradient of sodium into the cells, and intercellular fluid, and into the bloodstream. Active transport of sodium also establishes a net positive charge that facilitates the absorption of chlorine via an electrochemical gradient. Therefore, the absorption of water is closely tied to the absorption of electrolytes. The next major function of the large intestine is to store and eliminate waste. Food moves through the colon at about 5 to 10 centimeters per hour and usually moves through the colon within 16 to 20 hours, but some residue can remain in the colon for up to a week. Another essential function of the large intestine is to serve as home to the 100 trillion bacteria, archaea, fungi, and viruses that constitute the human microbiome. 30 to 40 species account for 99% of the bacteria in the gut, especially Clostridium perfringens, Bacteroides, Fragilis, and Enterobacter aeruginis. Some ingested vitamin K is absorbed in the small intestine, but most is derived from the synthesis of menaquinone by Bacteroides. We all know we should eat a high-fiber diet, even though we cannot digest it. However, gut bacteria do possess enzymes capable of breaking down complex polysaccharides into short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Colonocytes import these fatty acids through sodium monocarboxylate transporters. This not only helps the colon absorb water more efficiently, but also provides an additional source of energy, allowing us to metabolize up to about 10% of this undigestible material. The gut microbiota also metabolize bile acids into secondary bile acids, such as deoxycholic acid and lithocholic acid, and they reduce urobilinogen to stricobilin, which gives feces its characteristic color. They're also protective and help to detoxify xenobiotics and prevent colonization by pathogenic bacteria. However, bacteria also produce gases and indoles, which contribute to fecal odor. The gut microbiota also influence the central nervous system through the gut-brain axis. But that's a topic for another day. The large intestine is responsible for absorbing the remaining water and electrolytes, eliminating waste, and serving as host to the gut microbiota. Although the colon is a frequent site of cancer, endoscopy provides a powerful tool for early detection and removal of lesions. The digestive system tries valiantly to extract value from whatever food we choose to eat. In that sense, the GI tract is surely our most accommodating system.